Ailage yields lag uh, quite a bit behind. Um, so I think we really need to work on improving our forage yields. And we probably have, we don't have a good handle on what our forage yields are as part of the problem. You know, we have yield monitors on our combines and, and um, just a little harder to get a handle on what management practices are giving that, that higher forage yield. And we're getting higher land costs now. It costs a lot more to rent land. So we need to, to, to keep up and, and maintain our acreages relative to corn and soybeans and that. We need to get more yields. Um, so I think, uh, and, and that's going to lower our costs, say our cost per unit. Um, I, I think there's four things that we can fairly easily focus on to try to increase forage yields, alfalfa yields, alfalfa mixtures, and one is to shorten our stand age. I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, keep our rotations a little tighter. Uh, soil fertility, we're seeing big problems with in, in, uh, in soil fertility in some cases um, where soil tests are really low and they're definitely limit, limiting yields uh, and forages. And I think an another thing we can work at is do a lot better job at establishment. And try to, that first year we put our alfalfa in, or uh, alfalfa mixtures in, in the spring, um, you know, we're, we're probably looking at maybe 60% of what we would normally get in, in, a, in a year, right? Where instead of getting that first cut in end of May, 1st of June, we're waiting till the 1st of July to get that. So we basically missed the equivalent of, of a first cut. And I think there's some, some by focusing on, on establishment practices, I think we can narrow that a little bit and get more yield during that establishment year. And of course, the other thing that we that we don't do a really good job on, I think, is is pest management and leaf hopper. We kind of touched on that. I added a few slides as Ashley was finishing up. We can we can talk about that if, if we have enough time. Cost of producing hay, and I, you know, this is on a hay basis. Uh, and I just thrown some numbers out, and I'm not saying these are average numbers or what the numbers should be or anything like that. I'm just doing some math. But if you take establishment costs and you take uh, four and a half dollar a pound seed and three and a half tons an acre over three years and you do the math and you spread that out, works out to about seven tenths of a cent, right? P and K removal right now is about a cent and a half a pound. If you're not putting manure back and you're replacing it with, P with commercial fertilizer, about a cent and a half. It was well over two cents back there three or four years ago and uh, when, when prices peaked. And, and that, that was a significant proportion of the cost. Uh, and so you have to consider that if you're in the game of selling hay, uh, remember that that's part of your cost. Those nutrients are leaving your farm. Land rental, I change this every meeting I go to. <laughs> uh, and it's funny, I always ask, what's, what's land rent for? And nobody can tell me, nobody knows, eh? depending on whether you're buying or selling. To be a renter or a landlord, nobody uh, nobody wants to say anything. But I, I did some math there and took that three and a half tons and uh, at, at 175 bucks, and I think that's about two and a half cents. So that, that's a fair amount. That's a major cost, right? Land cost is a major cost. Um, harvest, you know, if I use custom rates here, you're somewhere between two, two and a half cents a pound. So that, that's a significant cost too. And then of course storage, if you were to build a barn, you know, a coverall or whatever and jam it full of hay and amortize it over 15 or 20 years. I mean, you can use whatever number you want, but you're probably about half a cent for that. So we're up to about seven and a half cents. Um, you know, that 0.7 cents, we worry about the cost of whether or not we should keep a field and whether we should get a, try to get another yield, another year out of that field or not. And, and that's the least of your problems. The establishment cost is like, um, it is, is less than 10% of your of the cost of, of production. So, and, and what you have to notice here is that really that land costs and the harvesting costs, you're going over the field once whether, you've, whether you're taking, you know, two ton or, or one ton, right? Uh, one has twice the cost per, per amount of harvest. So those are your two big costs right there. And those are yield driven. The more yield you can get, the, the better your cost, the lower your cost of production is. It's not this, this 0.7 cents up here. So increasing yield reduces costs, um, you know, by, by moving from three ton to four ton, you know, you you're really significantly reduce your, your, your cost of producing hay. So shortening rotation is one thing that we can do, okay? How many years do you leave down a, an alfalfa mixture, alfalfa stand? How many years? 
Three. Three. Yeah, that's good. Three. Two. You know what? Two. That's not including the seven. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I remember there's a bit of everybody speaks a different language on standing years, but yeah. So that that's good. Um, you know, and I think that's probably where you're about you want to be. Um, and uh, as stands age, they yield less, and they also want to winter kill more on us, right? They're, they're weaker. Um, and uh, so when you when you rotate, you take that 100, 100 pounds nitrogen credit to the corn crop that's following the alfalfa, right? $100 or 100 pounds, so depending on what the price of nitrogen is, let's just say that's $60. Um, and in addition to that, there's a 10 to 15%, some people say 20% yield benefit to the corn crop falling alfalfa, in addition to the nitrogen credit, as opposed to corn after corn. So, you know, you do the math, even at a measly uh, $4 a, a, a bushel or something like that, um, you know, you add these together, and, and, <coughs> and you're easily paying the cost of, of, of buying a seed and reseeding a field. Okay, it's paid by the benefit to the corn crop. So if in doubt, rotate your crop. You know, this agonizing over and trying to pack stands, you know, you get out there, oh, should I no-till in some red clover or should I, you know, should I put some Italian ryegrass in it? Rotate, if, unless you've been totally asleep and it's too late, uh, reseed in a field, in a, you know, reseed someplace else and put corn in that old beat up hay field that you're worried about. You can, this is Dan Undersanders, Wisconsin data, but actually the, 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 you know, you're at about, you know, 50, 60% yield during your establishment year. And then if you call year one, hundred percent, you know, year two is close to, close to that. But then yields start to decline and you're, you know, by the time you get down to 40, fourth year, you're down into 70% or something. Can you imagine taking 70% of your soybean yield as being okay? As being acceptable? I mean, you would, or corn yield? I mean, you wouldn't do that, right? And we shouldn't do it with alfalfa either. Um, so, I think, you know, it's good establishment minimizes that, that establishment year yield loss. Um, you know, and it comes down to it's just basic seed placement, packing was really important, tile drainage, uh, getting it in seeded in a, in, in a good timely manner, it was weed control, um, and, and uh, the other alternative of course is summer seedings, I'll talk a little bit about that. And the advantage to a summer seeding, so that be seeding after wheat comes off or something like that, is that the following year I get 100%, I have 100% yield potential, right? I'm not taking that establishment year yield loss. So, so that's an advantage um, if, if you can pull it off. So I think start with good P and K, uh, good, good fertility. This is a soil and crop uh, picture here from 1940. You know, we're talking, we were, they were doing trials on, on potash, on K, on alfalfa. Uh, you know, the war was on and we needed to produce more food and, and so there was a big push. And here we are, how many years later, 70 years later, and we're still talking about low potash levels and how we can improve production. So some things don't change very much. But in, do you, everybody know what their soil test levels are, sort of? Yeah, everybody kind of has a handle on that, and you should, you know? When you get that soil test report, focus in on uh, uh, P and K and pH and, uh, and, and get a handle on where your fields are in that. For forages, we like to be, you know, optimum, we like to be about 12 parts per million phosphate and about 120 parts per million potash. Below that, we're starting to lose yield, okay? Um, so, removal, forages have high removal rates, you know, about 13, 14 pounds of phosphate, 50, 55 pounds of, of, uh, of potash, you know, a cent and a half. Um, everybody, you know, the dairy farmers think, well, I don't have a, a, a fertility problem because I put manure on. And, and we're seeing uh, low soil test levels even on dairy farms. And I'll, I'll show you a bit uh, why that is. We did a survey in East Central Ontario and, um, and oh, this, no, sorry, that, that was another survey. This one was done by Bonnie Ball and she went out and, and did tissue testing and she was looking for sulfur deficiencies, but she looked at potash. 37% of them came back of, of the samples she did, the top six inches of alfalfa stems ran them around the province, came back low on K, deficient on K. That's a pretty scary number for me, anyway. So start with good fertility. Um, um, you know, it's a good opportunity if you're gonna put uh, 
uh, manure on, solid manure, you're going to do some tillage. Uh, anybody use a starter pea? You know, our grandfathers used to put starter pea on through the old grain drill, right? You know, we had the bag of, bags of triple 15 and, and uh, actually, so we got away from that over the years. But there's, you know, because our, our drills, we, we don't just still, still do that anymore. Uh, but there actually is a, a starter effect to, to, uh, to banding pea under, under, just something to keep in mind. I'm not suggesting everybody go out and, and, and get, get the old drill out, of the shit, out of behind the shed, but uh, and you see a, a benefit even if your fertility levels are high. Yeah, um, it, 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 unless they're extremely high, yeah. yeah. This, this one was uh, Paul Sullivan Gates sent. I got this picture from him. Paul, I don't know if you know him, he's a pretty good crop specialist from Eastern Ontario. And uh, this picture he, here, he said, had, had very high soil test levels on P. And quite, quite evident that, you, you know, there's, there's an effect there, a P effect. I mean, we banned corn. I mean, that's where it's at. You know, you talk to Greg Stewart and it's all about banning uh, phosphorus and getting a big, you know, getting more bang for your dollar from your P dollar by, by doing that. So here, here's a, uh, just a graph. It shows relative yields, right? There's 100%. And uh, there's the soil test levels for P. You know, I said we wanted it to be about 12. You know, if you draw, drew a, a regression line through there, there's a steep curve and then it's flat, right? So there really isn't any real response to getting P other than banding uh, over, over and above that 12 parts per million. But if you're down here where, five, where you're five, you know, and you're, you're at about 70% yield potential. So you've taken a 30% yield loss uh, because of low fertility. And very similar here for potash, um, and you know, I said that 120, so anything above that, it's, fl it's flat, right? There's no extra yield to be got from applying, fr from increasing your soil test up here, but down here, um, you know, yield losses are fairly significant. And what we're seeing is, is P's not bad. Um, P levels, soil test levels are, are fairly reasonable, but potash levels uh, appear to be, there, there's some really low ones out there. Um, you know, a three-ton crop, that's pretty modest, that's not a big yield, but, but that's removing about almost $100 an acre in P and K. That seems to be a psychological barrier. People don't like to go above that, but, but uh, you know, it costs a lot. So P and K recommendations, if, if you pick up the agronomy guide, OMAF agronomy guide, that uses a sufficiency approach. And so that's really a one-year approach. So, you know, using research and a, and a curve, um, you know, that last uh, dollar's worth of fertilizer produces a dollar's worth of hay and then you stop there, right? That's kind of that, uh, so it's a one-year approach. But that might be less than removal. Um, so, and then the, the other appro uh, approach used by some people is that build up and maintenance approach. So that's targeting that 120 parts per million and uh, replacing the removal and then adding some more to build up. You say you're at uh, 90, adding more potash to build up to that 120. That, so that's kind of a longer term approach. So this, this tends to get used on land that you own and, and this tends to be used on land that's rented, right? Uh, this is a one year maximum economic benefit in one year and this is a long term uh, approach to try to get soil test levels to that, to, to where you want to be. Um, sulfur on alfalfa, anybody using sulfur? Anybody tried it? No. Um, we, you know, we, um, we, we did trials for years and years and years and could never see a response to sulfur. We used to get all this free sulfur from, from industrial Detroit and, and Chicago and all those industrial cities in the Midwest that sulfuric acid used to come down and fertilize their soils. And then the EPA went and cleaned that up uh, for a large part, and now we don't get those those uh, sulfur deposits like we used to. So now we're starting to see some responses, not always, um, but but quite often. And um, we tend to see a response really on on low organic matter soils, you know, sandier soils. There's quite a bit of sulfur in organic matter, and and that sulfur is always that organic matter is breaking down and, and, and providing sulfate in the soil for, for plants to, to use. So sandier soils, you tend to uh, see 
see more of a response to added sulfur. And so soils with no, that haven't got any manure. So if you, there's a lot of sulfur in dairy manure. So if you're putting lo you know, lots of uh, dairy manure on, you, you may not see a response to sulfur because you're already putting it on with, uh, um, with, with manure. Well, where I tend to see, see a big response is, is those, I call them ca cash crop hay fields. You know, fields that tend to be older and, and don't get that $100 of fertilizer every year and, and um, you know, for some fairly dramatic increases. This was at the Allura Research Station there last July uh, for FarmSmart Conference. And you can see where the sulfate was put on in these strips, pretty dramatic, you know. And if you just had this, you'd think, oh geez, it's dry, you know, not my fault, nothing I can do about it. But, but there actually was a huge response, uh, yield response to that, to that sulfur. Sulfur behaves a bit like the nitrogen cycle. There isn't really good soil test for it. Uh, it changes depending on rainfall and, and, uh, and that. Going back to the manure application, yep. how long do you have the sulfur effect? I mean, we try not to spread the manure on the hay fields. So yeah. like, it can be three, well, two, yeah. like three years. So it's yeah, so, so, it's so Wisconsin, they, they've got probably 20 years more history of this than we do because they're, they're kind of upwind of most of that pollution that we, we used to get. Um, and, and they're seeing a response on about 80% of their fields now. Um, but but they, they're saying two to three years, you know, with that, that uh, you know, if, if you've got a field that hasn't received manure in two or three years, sounds kind of vague, but there's a lot of variables there that you're likely to see a response to solve. So, I mean, it's there, it'll depend on how much, uh, how much manure went on there, how, what, what the soil type is, um, you know, the, how much got leached out, was it a wet year, all those things, but um, yeah, I mean, maybe, and, and that's kind of tossed around as a theory, you know, that manure response that we see, is that a sulfur? Uh, in some cases, could, could be, could be. Um, there's again those pictures from, uh, from Alora, you know, you pretty dramatic, uh, the, and, and that, that was just on second cut. Um, so you can tissue test. For it, you know, you take the top six inches of 35 stems or whatever, 30, 40 stems, ship them to a lab, and, um, and it, 0.25 percent sulfur is kind of that level that anything above that you're probably okay. You won't see a response to sulfur. Anything below that, um, you will. Uh, Bonnie Ball, fertility specialist, did a survey there three years ago, I guess it was. 21 percent of them came back. Um, deficient in sulfur, and I, I don't know, that seems low to me. It's interesting too that there was 37% deficient in K, so there's no sense going out chasing this, uh, you know, chasing this one if you're already low in potash, right? Get the, get the big ones, shoot the big fish first, and then, and then, uh, and then go after that. Um, you know, uh, leave a test trip, you know, just leave the spot. And then, if you see a response, you'll you'll feel good about it, and if you don't, well, then uh, maybe not so much. But uh, I, I think that that's always uh, a, a good idea. There's there's uh, you know the tissue tests, top six inches. That there's uh, uh, deficient 0.18 uh, as opposed to a field that had 0.34. There's lots of sulfur there. Pretty pretty dramatic difference. Um, so plants need need uh, the sulfur to be in the sulfate form in order to take it up, right? They can't take up elemental S, so um, it, it gets uh, uh, thrown on. If, if you put elemental sulfur on the soil, the microbes break it down and convert it to sulfate, but that takes time, right? So if, you, if you're going to put a sulfate on, sulfate fertilizer on, you'll get an immediate response. If you're going to do that, you might as well do it before first cut, you know, because 40% of your yields in that first cut. Um, if you wait, you know, you've already lost that opportunity if you wait and put it on after first cut. Um, sulfur, uh, it probably takes, you know, it, it takes some months for it to become available in the sulfate, uh, but it's cheaper. Um, and longer term benefits, so you know it's about a third of the price. 
So some people are putting that on at a step, you know, the fall before establishment, putting some, some elemental sulfur on, fairly cheap, about 33 cents a pound or something like that. You know, you might put on $15 worth of sulfur for, for three years or something like that. Um, ammonium sulfate, a lot, of, a lot of it's getting used. The, I pulled these prices off there last fall, I guess it was. But, you know, the sulfates you're looking at maybe 80 cents. The, the, the alfalfa doesn't really need this nitrogen, but even if you value it at a zero, it's still a fairly cheap source of sulfate. So if I was going to do a spring application, um, you know, uh, ammonium sulfate might be uh, might be the one I choose. Uh, K-Mag is fairly inexpensive as well and, and fairly common. Can you get K-Mag around here? Yeah, we have yeah. yeah, it's a pretty good source as well. So you kind of need to price it out depending on what local prices are. <laughs> Potassium sulfate really makes a good sense from a from a chemistry point of view, but can you get potassium sulfate? Yeah, it's bulk. Yeah, yeah we, it's very expensive. But we yeah, we, we can get it in my neck of the woods. It comes in a one-ton tote and it costs a fortune. So chemically, it makes that's in theory that's the one I would use because I need the the K anyways. But it's just not economic in our area. Uh, some people are using gypsum. The, the elemental sulfur certainly is. Uh, is, is the cheapest. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you know, about five pounds per ton of yield expected, you know, 50, 20, 20 pounds or something like that. We're still getting a, a little bit of free sulfur, but not just not as much as what we used to. There's uh, a plot there that, that uh, where elemental sulfur was put on in the fall previous. You know, pretty dramatic difference, you can see, uh, by putting that elemental sulfur on it. Joel? Yeah? If you have low potash levels, are you going to get more bang for your buck with the sulfur than in Penn High, or is it any correlation? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they are related. And um, you're, you, um, salt, I, that's why I said, you know, you can't ignore the potash. If, if you're low potash, that's a micronutrient and uh, a macronutrient, and, and you need to correct that. But there seems to be more of a response. Um, to add it, add a K when on those fields, when you add, and they tend to go together, right? A field that's low in K tends to be low in sulfur as well. As an head manure, um, you know, probably older, um, and so yeah, yeah. I think the two of them. It's really important to, you know, to don't jump on the sulfur bandwagon without getting on the on the K bandwagon while you're at it. Soil pH, uh, that's probably not a big issue, um, but definitely soil pH, uh, you know, 6, 7 is probably where you want to be. Um, so forage establishment, we want that quick, uh, aggressive start. Um, um, you know, I think, and I talked about some of the things that, uh, key things that we can do, you know, use a, use a good variety. Um, anybody use these testing? The, we're, we're, we're probably, at the end of the road where we're going to lose those brochures, uh, the testing program. Uh, we're not getting, companies aren't interested in entering. It's not compulsory for them to, to enter varieties anymore. CFA has changed the rules so it's it's optional and none of them are seem too interested in entering varieties. So we probably won't have a variety, third party uh, university variety testing in the future. Uh, we're kind of at that crossroad right now. We're waiting for entries and, and not getting any, and so we'll have to see where that. Uh, so, I mean, there's a bunch of new varieties coming on the market. It's going to be buyer beware, you know. Uh, it's kind so of how do, you, how do you, like, where do you have these sites? At the Alara Research Station and uh, Winchester, um, New Lister. You know, we used to have a site at Centralia, and nobody entered varieties there anymore, so it got dropped. We, we tried to get a site at Woodstock and couldn't seem to get that one off the ground. Um, but, yeah. Anyway. Would it more or less determine or measures the, the survivability? Well, they do. Um, so, um, it used to be in order to get a variety registered, you had to, to, had to enter them. So they do a uh, yield index on them uh, up to four years. Um, and, you know, that yield index tells you whether or not it died or not, right? Yeah. You know, whether your yield index goes up every year or whether it goes down every year. Uh, tells you how, how persistent they are. And we always made notes to, uh, on the grasses, um, grass species, it was really interesting because it, they took heading dates. 
So you knew what the early orchard grass was and the late orchard grass and, and when they headed relative to the timothy and variety and, and that kind of stuff. So there's some really useful information out of those trials, but I'm afraid unless some, you know, and, and less companies and the, you know, the, the DFO and the BFO are, would have to chip in some money to make it all work. Is, is the Forge Council thinking about addressing this at all? Or, or well, yeah, they're addressing it, but I mean, they have no money either. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, there's two issues there. One is no money, and the other one is um, companies, not all the companies want to play, right? Um, in every trial, there's, there's one winner and, uh, and a bunch that didn't, um, you know, the, 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 the top loser and the second top loser, <laughs> you, you know, and, uh, from, that, that's, that's an issue is trying to get companies to, you know, is that part of their marketing plan or not, right? So, but I mean, if they're, if it's going to go this year, they've got to get in the ground here, um, you know, within six weeks or so, so, um, yeah, that's what I just talked about. So, um, what happened here? There's a new seating. What, what's that all about? <laughs> yeah, manure, manure spreader. Manure spreader? No. We was in the two, two bumpy soil, a pack of soil down on the uh, good establishment of the wheel track. Yeah, yeah. So is that before the drill or after the drill? That's, that could be the drill. Yeah, that's before the drill. So that, th those, um, yeah, it's lack of pack, right? And, um, you know, wherever these tire tracks are, the, you know, they did some deep cultivation, they ran the harrows over, they got it all fluffed up, and then put the drill in, and where the, where it was packed before the drill by the, by the uh, likely by the tractor tires, is good, is well established. So if you'd packed the entire field, it would have looked like that. Um, you know, big, and, and that's a very, very, I think that's the number one mistake that that we've seen with forage establishment is not enough packing. Um, so seed bed preparation, you know, that loose lumpy soil, you get poor seed to soil contact, for one thing, you know, those are little tiny seeds and if it's surrounded by air it, 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 and no moisture, it, it won't germinate, it's got to be have some surrounded by soil and, and moisture and, and you'll get quick germination and quick growth. Um, and the other thing is, if if you, if some you, you may want to pack before the drill because if you've got nice fluffy soil, it, it, the drills really don't do that great a job of, on seed depth. You know, they're really Peter Johnson calls them the old cereal drill a, a control spill device, right? <laughs> There's no seed placement. You know, it'll it, it got a little little opening, and we drop the seed, and we hope that it, you know we're top we're saying quarter of an inch, but especially in a fluffy Soil, some of it might be an inch and some might be on the surface, right? Um, and, and you know, all over the place. So when we pack it before, we've got a lot, not only do we have better seed to soil contact, but we've got more even, uh, better seed placement, right? More more uh, control over our seed placement. So Those fluffy soils really dry out. Yeah. So we should be packing before and after the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's it's ideal. I mean, this, that, that, um, I, I, I would say that was, could, could have, for sure, would have benefited from before. That was probably, there's probably a packer pulled pull behind the drill on that, but but not packed before. So, I mean, it depends on how, you know, what kind of drill you have and, and your soil type and how, you know, how deep you do the tillage and all those things. But, but uh, I think in many cases, uh, and I know it's another trip and you're busy seeding, you know, there's not a lot of time because uh, you're trying to get seeding done, but that extra packing, I think, would make a big difference in a lot of cases. Yeah. Which do you see people have better luck with, the drill or with the brilliant? I, I'm going to talk about that here in about two, two seconds, yeah. Um, so, you know, the old story, uh, three-eighths of an inch, um, and I think that's pretty important. So here we go, here's the drills. So who, who uses one of these no-till drills? Yeah, and uh, green drill. And a brilliant. Okay, so that's pretty typical. I mean, there's there's some uh, some of everything, and they all kind of have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the conventional grain drill, you know, you've got your your um, um, your small seed box, your alfalfa timothy, 
goes through that and uh, your cereal box and grandpa always had the large seed box but some of our girls don't anymore right you get some rain and some crusting you know you don't want to be packing uh, wet soils um, but uh, yeah so you, you want a little bit of seed uh, on, the, on the surface right and that depends on how well packed you are before the drill goes in and all that but if it, it's don't get too panicky. I mean, it is a controlled spill device, right? So if, if you don't see any on the surface, you're probably too deep. And yeah. Well, I know years ago I planted a grow and they just so I just mix it in with the grain. Yeah, yeah. And grown likes to be on the surface almost, really shallow, and then you know you're putting it in at an inch yeah, or whatever with right. the grain drill, and some of it would come up, but you know a lot of it wasn't. And people still do that because we lock, you know. They lost uh, that from yeah, our grandfathers were a lot smarter than us, even though they had smaller farms and smaller equipment and smaller tractors and smaller loans. Um, you, you know, we, we lost the ability to, to, to use starter fertilizer and uh, and and uh, coarser seeds. You know, um, does that grow never come out or is it lost? No, I'd say it'll, uh, it, some of it will come up, but but a lot of it's lost. Yeah. And you know, people put on more seed, and uh, it's, I, mean, I can talk about species if you like, but you know, Rome's probably in a dairy really doesn't fit that well in a dairy in, a, in an aggressive cutting schedule. It really doesn't. Rome does well in a two cut system, and eh, not too bad for a year or two in a three cut system. It really prefers a no cut system in the fence row, <laughs> <laughs> right? Rome, um, but it doesn't like aggressive cutting schedules, and it doesn't like to be cut short. So if you've got a really aggressive dairy haylage type system, it tends to die out. You know? But for all, I was always told you'll see it the first year, but I mean the first cutting, but you'll never see it after. Well, all the grasses are basically that way. Timothy's the worst. Uh, Timothy's a one cut wonder, right? So it not only does it have is it shallow rooted, um, it, so it doesn't like dry weather, right? It doesn't like droughts because it's shallow rooted. It, it likes increasing day lengths, so it's good right up to the 21st of June, and then days start getting shorter, and and, and Timothy says, oh, I think I'm, I'm done. And I don't get any regrowth. So you got a Timothy, Timothy first cut, and alfalfa, some alfalfa second cut, third cut. Yeah. Why is even that Timothy in Yeah, well, why is Timothy, it's the most popular grass in Ontario, and because two reasons, it heads the latest, so it's easier, you know, it's higher quality when we can, can get our, our haylage cut, right? Everything else heads earlier, so it's lower quality. And the other reason is that it's small seeded and mixes with the alfalfa and goes through the small seed box, right? We don't have that coarse seed box, right? And, and, and that's, uh, now we're seeing, you know, some people are putting small amounts of some of the, you know, some orchard grass. Everybody wants this magic grass that'll do it all and they're really you know they've all got their advantages and disadvantages um yeah so brilliant um you know it does have the form most of them have a fine box and a coarse box right so you can get on those grasses um and uh it's got a built-in packing it's got two packing wheels really here so you're back you are packing before and packing after and I, I, I've heard the comment from from some people saying, "Well, you know, I bought, I used to use a grain drill, and now I use a Brilliant, and boy, was that ever an improvement! Those Brilliants are a lot better." And I would say probably for him it is because he wasn't packing enough with the grain drill, right? Um, there, there maybe have some limitations. You get some hard, you know, some some really sandy soils, but those some of those those clay soils uh, might be a little tougher as well. So I think they. You know they can they can all work both work but um, then the no-till you know it's kind of the Cadillac um, it, the the advantage it has is the depth control and, and the packing wheels right so you're doing a lot better more precise job on on seat placement uh, if you want to do no-till I mean you know you can do some tillage if you want to just do you know that that burn down and weed control is really important uh, you know no-till that residue control is, you know, you've got to, you can't have too much residue on there. Um, and, and if you do, you know, you want something that the drill can handle. And really important for seed placement and slugs. Um, yeah.
So if you're working it before to get rid of some of your trash, packing would be almost necessary for this? Yeah, depending on how you did it. You know, a cultivator, yes. You know, uh, some vertical tillage, maybe not. Maybe, you know, it might be okay. So, um, yeah. Well, there we go. Seeding depth. Um, quarter of an inch on most soils, you know. Um, it, this is all theoretical, of course, because especially with those controlled spill devices, you're all, you know, you're, you're all over the map. Sandier soils, you know, maybe half an inch or something like that uh, uh, is where we want to be. But I think that's fairly important. Broadcast seeding, you know, some, anybody do broadcast seeding? Well, uh, our no-till drill, we put it on top in front of the drill. We don't even put it in. We oh, broadcast, on broadcast it on and then run the drill over? Yeah, and then we have the nurse crop. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, yeah. here's the yeah. like yeah. nurse crop. I'm going to get there in a second, but two seconds, two seconds. Yeah. So, um, you know, the broadcast, you know, it's faster. That's why people like it. Um, you know, the seed depth can be controlling. You want that shallow, but not too deep, right? And, um, you know, you need to do something afterwards, you know, the no-till drill or a packer or something so you've got seed to soil contact. Uh, the airflow spread patterns a lot better than the spinners, you know, especially when you've got mixtures, you've got heavier seed and light seed and you don't get a very even distribution with the spinners. Um, yeah, so seeding rate, what's everybody use? What kind of seeding rate? 18 pounds. 18, yeah. Anybody else? 15, 17. 15, 17, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm saying 12 to 15. I mean, um, you, you know, some people put on more, that's fine. Um, we see a lot of people overseeding or underseeding. You know, you really need to calibrate. The, the drills aren't calibrated very well. And, and um, you know, if you want to save yourself some money, you know, calibration is one thing. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that you might want to think about. The, the, there is a question, you know, do those high seeding rates make finer stem hay? And, and we did some research and actually they, they did, um, the high seeding rates. But, you know, basically if we put on 15 pounds, you know, we we're putting on 75 pounds of seed per square foot, you know, what, what emerges is about 60% of that. Typically, we're down to 45. Year one, the following spring, you know, half of those survive, we're down to 25. And then the year after that in the spring, you know, a third of them survive, we're down to eight or nine plants. And it doesn't seem to matter how many we put on here, you put on more here, more die, and we, and we end up about the same place, right? Eventually. Um, and uh, this is Dan Undersander's slide, but it kind of shows, shows the same thing with with 9, 12, 15, and 18 pounds, you know, after that, uh, into the second year, they're basically all, all the same. And uh, we, we did some, uh, some trials at Alora and, and, and Skill in Durham region, and, and basically those high seeding rates, we did 5, 10, 15, and 20, no differences in yield. Even the five pounds did as well as the, as the 20. Uh, but we did see that the 20, High seeding rate did have finer stamps because it was less mature. Um, so I think it depends a little bit. You know, if you're making dry hay, that's the people that want that fine stem stuff. Not that critical when you're blowing it uh, into the silo. Uh, a direct seeding versus a nurse crop. Who who, you, who does direct seeds? Somebody. Y'all do. You do direct seeds? Yeah. Nurse crops. Yeah. So what do you use for nurse crops? Easily. Peas and oats? Peas and oats. Peas and oats. Anybody else? Spring wheat. Spring wheat. Oats. Oats. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. And, and I think, uh, um, you know, they, they both work, you know, depending on the, on the soil that we're dealing with and, and your goals and what you're feeding and all that type of thing. But direct seedings, I, I'd say in general, maybe require a little better management and maybe a little better soil, some well, you know, drainage helps a lot, uh, gotta be seeded early, you know, to, to get a jump on the weeds. Weeds are a bit more of an issue with the direct seedings. And uh, so, you know, ideally April's good, or, or the first week of May. Uh, you gotta have clean fields, so you gotta be doing a good weed job of weed control in the whole rotation, you know, to, to, so you've got, 
cut the weeds down to a, to a dull roar, uh, the perennial weeds. Um, and then, you know, the anybody, so everybody makes forage of it or does somebody leave it and combine it? Yeah. I combine it. Yeah. So, I mean, in general, we, we suggest taking it, you know, as forage and not combining it. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that. Direct seedings, you know, you want to uh, avoid any fields prone to erosion, right? You know, that just takes the alfalfa forage mixture a lot longer to to, uh, to establish itself and you're pretty vulnerable during that period to uh, erosion if you've got some slope and some water moving across there. And you probably want to avoid really heavy clays as well. Uh, maybe don't work as well. Herbicide weed control, we really don't have, you know, they've got a lot more herbicide options in the U.S. than what we do here. We're, we're still working with, what, 60-year-old, 50-year-old technology, 2,4-DB, right? Um, as opposed to look at the other herbicides that have been introduced in other crops, and, and we're still using this old technology. But, um, you know, I think, you know, some glyphosate in the rotation or something to control the, the quack grass and the perennial weeds. Um, pretty important. Um, the the 24 db controls annual broadleaf weeds, right? And uh, the label says one to four trifoliate stage of the alfalfa is where you want to be. Earlier is better than later, you know. Um, it's easier on the alfalfa, and, and you and you can get better weed control, right? You, the, the weeds are, are are easier to kill. So you know you probably want to really really pay attention. And get out there and walk in, and walk the field a little bit and see what stage of the alfalfa where, where it's at and how good a job you did seeding. Well, you'll learn a lot about that too. You know, if you've got even seed placement and even germination, you, you've got it all kind of in the in the first trifoliate, second trifoliate, or whatever. And if you've got one of those control spill devices where some of it was on the surface and one and some of it's an inch deep, you'll have you'll have uh, leaf stages all over the place. But once you get past about the third or fourth trifoliate stage, 2,4-DB is pretty hard on alfalfa. Um, so it's really important to, to, to get it on early. Um, severe, you, you can get some fairly severe injury uh, when you're, when you're uh, getting it too, too mature. So everybody knows what a tri trifoliate looks like, right? So, uh, you know, when we see it come out of the ground, we've got these cotyledons, and then we've got this unifolia, right? Same as soybeans and other legumes. And then we've got, finally we, here we've got the first trifoliate. <coughs> and here we've got two trifoliates. There's one and there's one, right? And so you need to get out, walk the field, and, and make sure that spraying is done in, in a timely manner. Um, it'll, 24 db actually kind of sets alfalfa back for two or three weeks. And you, you, you know you want to you want to kill the weeds, but ideally we'd be using something that didn't hurt the alfalfa. But it it does, particularly when it's really hot and dry uh, and mature. Those are the three things that you want to avoid putting 2,4 dB on hot, dry, and too too mature. Uh, a lot of people are using reducing the rate, you know, maybe half half rate, and and getting yeah, acceptable weed control without without uh, hurting the alfalfa too bad. Um, really, you need you, a little bit MCPA. That, that's tough on alfalfa too. If you've got a mustard control, a mustard problem, then then uh, it's labeled with with the boat. I forget what it is. So many mills, uh, maybe 30 mills or something with the 24DB be on the label. But um, be really aware of this <coughs> this um, this effect on summer seedings. Anybody do summer seedings? I think I asked you that once and nobody said no. Summer seedings especially because if you slow up that alfalfa and delay its growth, you might not have enough growth there to survive in the winter, right? So it, it uh, uh, becomes really important. So companion crop, lots of people using companion crops, you know, oats, barley, spring wheat, uh, triticale, forage pea mixtures, and, and I mean, they all have their advantages in it. Depends a bit on, on what you're feeding and what you're trying to do, but the whole idea is to is to compete with the weeds, and it provides some quick cover for erosion control if you're on fields with a bit of slope that are prone uh, to erosion. Um, oats pretty palatable. You get some rust sometimes. 
Um, you know, spring wheat has the advantage that it doesn't tiller as much, so it, it, it competes less um, with the with the stand uh, with, the, with the new seed, seedlings underneath. And triticale is really a cross between rye and, and wheat, right? So you've got intermediate uh, peas. You know, a lot of people are using that to, to make feed for dairy cattle because it's uh, because of the forage quality. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think as far as whether to take it as a forage crop, you know, the 1st of July or sometime, or whether to combine it as grain, uh, there is some risk leaving it to combine as grain, as, uh, to, the, to the new seedings. And uh, you tend, I think the research is, is pretty conclusive on this as well, but you tend to get a better forage stand taking that off as forage. Um, and, you know, I guess the limitation for some people is that they don't, you can't, you have to make it into haylage or baleage. And, you know, I guess there's some people that don't have the ability to do that. But it does avoid the competition and, and the potential lodging that you can get or, or straw laying, you know, if you, if you get a combine and then it starts raining for 10 days and you've got straw laying on top of those new seedings for, for a while, it, it's, it's not much of a, of a fair fight, right? Um, <laughs> So there's, there, there, this is what happened, um, you know, in this situation there, um, you know, that's, um, you know, that's a fair amount of competition there. Um, and same, I think that might be the same picture later, but, you know, there's where the windrows laid, laid too long. So the, the potential is there. Um, alfalfa autotoxicity, I mean, we, you hear about this quite a bit, but basically you don't want to reseed alfalfa after alfalfa, right? Rotate it into something else and, uh, you know, you've got an old, weak alfalfa field. Some people want to run the no-till drill through it and reseed alfalfa into it. Well, one thing you've got the alfalfa autotoxicity, so established, plant, established plants inhibit the germination and growth of new seedlings. But you've also got all that disease. That's why the field's in a mess in the first place. If you dug up some roots and cut some roots open, you'd probably find all kinds of fungal disease. And you're really, don't, you, you know, you're not, those poor new alfalfa seedlings, even if they germinated, they're, they're, they're gonna be loaded with disease anyways, if, if and don't rotate. Um, yeah, so not only does it uh, hamper germination, but it also hampers, even if they germinate, they may look okay, um, they have less root, root growth and, and you're gonna take a yield loss. Bottom line, you're gonna take a yield loss. And, and uh, Now the exception is a new seeding. So if I did put it through a spring seeding and it didn't hatch and I wanted to try that again the next year, that, that, would, be, that would be okay. Um, <coughs> thickening old stands, just, just don't, don't. Summer seedings, um, lots of people doing that. Um, you get the advantage is that you get full yield potential, right? You don't have that establishment year yield loss. Um, you don't want to use a companion crop. You know, it's a direct seeding. Um, lighter soils work pretty good. The, the, there's there's two risks basically, and 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 one is no rain, right? And the other one is the calendar. You know, you get that weed off. Um, you've got to control that volunteer wheat somehow <coughs> because it, it's going to be really thick. It's, it's all, you're going to have that volunteer wheat behind where the combine went and you will have, and, and if you don't control that some way, you'll have no alfalfa in those, those rows, right? Where the volunteer wheat was, the, the, the winter wheat will have competed and the alfalfa just won't establish there. So, you know, you've got to do some, get, you know, some people do a, do some tillage and and wait 10 days and hit it with, with glyphosate or something like that. Um, and, and all those winter cereal, you know, putting in the uh, Italian ryegrass and putting in, um, you know, oats or oat pea mixtures that are going to be harvested in the fall. That winter, volunteer winter wheat is always an issue with all of those that has to be controlled. Um, that's one thing that's been suggested for Roundup Ready alfalfa, if we ever get it, is that you could just go in there with the drill and, and, and drill it in and then, uh, and then spray it off and you kind of save yourself probably two weeks and, and 
gives you a window for for uh, for better establishment. So you know, in this area, you know, I, I think you want to be in by mid-August or something like that. Uh, don't ever try to do this with trefoil or reed canary grass. They're just too slow to germinate. And uh, yeah, potato leaf hopper. Um, actually, we, we started talking about this a little bit, but really important on new seedings to watch for potato leaf hopper because it really, if, if, if you get a lot of damage on a new seedings, it, it will reduce the yield for the life of the stand and make the stand want to die earlier, right? Um, it really affects, really no problem with leaf hopper in first cut, but once we get into July, that's you, you know, where, where we see problems. In 2012, we were above threshold levels. Everywhere we went to in the province, we were well above threshold levels. It was, uh, so we lost a significant amount of second and third cut to that. And the, the plants didn't, like that. it makes it tougher, severely damaged plants, it makes it tougher for them to get going again. And, uh, and survive the winter and do well the following year, uh, particularly new seedings. And it can be, you know, and what, once you see that, that hopper burn, once you see that, that, it's too late, the damage is done. You gotta cut that, harvest it, get it off the field, and then monitor the regrowth and spray the regrowth if, if you need to. And there are, there are thresholds that you use. Um, there are products. Um, Dimethylate and, and Matador, the two that that tend to get used uh, a fair amount. There, there's another picture from Paul Sullivan, but there it was it was sprayed on the right and not sprayed on the left. This is 2012, back when we you know we were we were drug striking, right? And um, that field went on and put up a pretty good second cut, and this field produced nothing, right? 